President. Um, you've said over and over again that immigrants shouldn't come to this country right now. This isn't the time to come. That message is not being received. Instead, the perception of you that got you elected as a moral, decent man is the reason why a lot of immigrants are coming to this country and entrusting you with unaccompanied minors. How do you resolve that tension? And how are you choosing which families can stay and which can, can go, given the fact that even though with Title 42 there are some families that are staying, and is there a timeline for when we won't be seeing these overcrowded facilities with, run by CPB when it comes to unaccompanied minors? Well, look, I guess I should be flattered people are coming because I'm the nice guy. That's the reason why it's happening that I'm a decent man or however it's phrased, that, you know, that's why they're coming, because, no, Biden's a good guy. Truth of the matter is, nothing has changed. As many people came, 28 percent increase in children to the border in my administration, 31 percent in the last year of — in 2019, before the pandemic, in the Trump administration. It happens every single solitary year. There is a significant increase in the number of people coming to the border in the winter months of January, February, March. It happens every year. In addition to that, there is a — and nobody — and by the way, does anybody suggest that there was a 31 percent increase under Trump because he was a nice guy and he was doing good things at the border? That's not the reason they're coming. The reason they're coming is that it's the time they can travel with the least likelihood of dying on the way because of the heat in the desert, number one. Number two, they're coming because of the circumstances in country, in country. The way to deal with this problem, and I started to deal with it back when I was a United States senator, I mean, a vice president, for putting together a bipartisan plan of over $700 million to do with the root causes of why people are leaving. What did Trump do? He eliminated that funding. He didn't use it. He didn't do it. And in addition to that, what he did, he dismantled all the elements that exist to deal with what had been a problem and, and has been — continued to be a problem for a long time. He, in fact, shut down the, uh, the number of beds available. He did not fund HHS to get people to get the children out of those — those Border Patrol facilities, where they should not be and not supposed to be more than a few days, a little while. But he dismantled all of that. And so what we're doing now is attempting to rebuild — rebuild the system that can accommodate the, the, what is happening today. And I'd like to think it's because I'm a nice guy, but it's not. It's because of what's happened every year. Let me say one other thing on this. If you take a look at the number of people who are coming, the vast majority, the overwhelming majority of people coming to the border and crossing are being sent back, are being sent back. Thousands, tens of thousands of people who are — who are — over the 18 years of age and single people, one at a time coming, have been sent back, sent home. We're sending back the vast majority of the families that are coming. We're trying to work out now with Mexico their w willingness to take more of those families back. But we, that, that's what's happening. They're not getting across the border. And those who are coming across the border who are unaccompanied children were moving rapidly to try to put in place what was dismantled, as I said. For example, of all the children are coming across the border, over 70 percent are either 16 or 17 years old. We're not talking about people ripping babies from mother's arms or little three-year-olds standing on the border. Less than, I think, it's one and a half percent fall in the category of the very young. So what we're doing is we're providing for the space, again, to be able to get these kids out of the Border Patrol facilities, which no child no one should be in any longer than 72 hours. And today, I went to, for example, I used all the resources available to me, went to the Defense Department, and, and the, the Secretary of Defense has just made available Fort Bliss, 5,000 beds, be immediately available, 5,000 beds in the Texas border. So we're building back up the capacity that should have been maintained and built upon, that Trump dismantled. It's going to take time. 
And the other thing we're doing, I might add, am I giving you too long an answer? Because if you don't want the detail. No, no, but I mean, I, I don't know how much detail you want about immigration. Maybe I'll stop there and finish. My, my follow-up question is, um, one, if you could talk a little bit about which, if you could talk a little bit about which families, why they're being allowed to stay, what the families that are being allowed to stay, why they're being allowed to stay. In addition to that, when it comes to the filibuster, which is what Zeke was asking about, there's immigration is, is a big issue, of course, with, when it related to the filibuster. But there's also Republicans who are passing bill after bill, trying to restrict voting rights. Chuck Schumer is calling it an, an existential threat to democracy. Why not back a filibuster rule that at least gets around issues including voting rights or immigration? Jim Clyburn, someone, of course, who you know very well, um, has backed the idea of a filibuster rule when it comes to civil rights and voting rights. Well, look, um, I'm going to deal with all of those problems. The question is the priorities as they come and land on my plate. Let's go to the first question you asked, the, the first of the second questions you asked. And that is, what about dealing with families? Why are not some not going back? Because Mexico is refusing to take them back. They're saying they won't take them back, not all of them. We're in negotiations with the president of Mexico. I think we're going to see that change. They should all be going back, all be going back. The only people we're not going to let sitting there on the other side of the Rio Grande by themselves with no help our children. And what we're doing there, and it's an important point to understand. I know you understand it. I don't mean to say it that way. An important point to focus on. The vast majority of people under the age of 18 come to the United States, come with a telephone number on, the, on a wristband, or come with a telephone number in their pocket in the United States. A mother, a father, a close relative, a grandma or grandpa. What was happening before is it's taking literally weeks and weeks and maybe even months before anybody pick up the phone and call to see if there really was someone there. Well, we've set up a system now where within 24 hours there's a phone call made as that person, that child crosses the border. And then a verification system being put in place as, as of today to determine quickly whether or not that is a trafficker being called or that is actually a mom, a dad, and or a close relative. They're establishing that right off the bat. If it, in fact, is mom or dad, dad says to take the extreme case, I got a birth certificate, then guess what? We're getting that kid directly to that parent immediately. And so that's going to reduce significantly. There's two ways to reduce child populations in circumstances that are not acceptable, like being held at a Border Patrol station. One is to get them to the place where they have a relative and set a date as to when a hearing can be held. The second way to do it is put them in a, a, a health and human services facility that we're occupying now, both licensed beds around the country that exist, as well as, for example, federal resources like Fort Bliss to get them safely in a place where they can be taken care of while their fate is determined. So filibuster. filibuster. Fill filibuster. Um, you know, with regard to the filibuster, I believe we should go back to a position of the filibuster that existed just when I came to the United States Senate 120 years ago. Um, and that is that it used to be required for the filibuster, and I, I had a card on this. I was going to give you the statistics, but you probably know them. Uh, that it used to be that, uh, the, that well, from between 1917 and 1971, the filibuster existed. There were a total of 58 motions to break a filibuster that whole time. Last year alone, there were five times that many. So it's being abused in a gigantic way. And for example, it used to be you had to stand there and talk and talk and talk and talk until you collapsed. And guess what? People got tired of talking and tired of collapsing. Filibusters broke down and we were able to break the filibuster, get a quorum and vote. So I strongly support moving in that direction. In addition to having an open mind about dealing with certain things that are 
are just elemental to the functioning of our democracy, like the right to vote, like the basic right to vote. We've amended the filibuster in the past. But here's the deal. As you observed, I'm a fairly practical guy. I want to get things done. I want to get them done consistent with what we promised the American people. And in order to do that, in a 50-50 Senate, we've got to get to the place where I get 50 votes so that the Vice President of the United States can break the tie, or I get 51 votes without her. And so I'm going to say something outrageous. I have never been particularly poor at calculating how to get things done in the United States Senate. So the best way to get something done, if you — if it holds near and dear to you that you uh, um, like to be able to — anyway, I've — we're going to get a lot done. And if we have to, if there's complete lockdown and chaos as a consequence of the filibuster, then we'll have to go beyond what I'm talking about. Okay. Cecilia Vega. I'd like to circle back to immigration, please. Uh, you, you just listed the reasons that people are coming, uh, talking about in-country problems, saying that it happens every year. You blamed the last administration. Sir, I just got back last night from a reporting trip to the border where I met nine-year-old Jose, who walked here from Honduras by himself. Uh, along with another little boy. He had that Astounding. phone number on him, and we were able to call his family. His mother says that she sent her son to this country because she believes that you are not deporting unaccompanied minors like her son. That's why she sent him alone from Honduras. So, sir, you blame the last administration, but is your messaging in saying that these children are and will be allowed to stay in this country and work their way through this process, encouraging families like Joe says, to come. Well, look, <laughs> the idea that I'm going to say, which I would never do, that if an unaccompanied child ends up at the border, we're just going to let him starve to death and stay on the other side. No previous administration did that either, except Trump. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. That's why I've asked the Vice President of the United States yesterday to be the lead person on dealing with focusing on the fundamental reasons why people leave Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador in the first place. It's because of earthquakes, floods. It's because of lack of food. It's because of gang violence. It's because of a whole range of things that when I was vice president had the same obligation to deal with unaccompanied children, I was able to get it slowed up significantly by working with the heads of state of those communities to do things like in one of the major cities, the reason people were leaving is they couldn't walk to the street because they were getting — their kids were getting beat up or shot or gang violence. Well, what I was able to do is not give money to the head of state because so many are corrupt, but I was able to say, okay, you need lighting in the streets to change things. I'll put the lighting in. We got a contractor. We got the type of lighting. We paid directly to the contractor, did not go through the government. And violent crime significantly was reduced in that city. Fewer people sought to leave. When this hurricane occurred, the two hurricanes, instead of us going down and helping in a major way so that people would not have a reason to want to leave in the first place because they didn't have housing or water or sustenance, we did nothing. We're going to do a lot in our administration. We're going to be spending that $700 plus million a year to change the life and circumstances of why people leave in the first place. That mother did not sit around with, on, on the kitchen table and, and say, you know, I got a great idea. Why I'm going to make sure my son gets taken care of is I'm going to put a — how old was he or she? He's, he's nine. I also met a 10-year-old. A, a, a nine-year-old, I'm going to send him on a thousand-mile journey across the desert and up to the United States because I know Joe Biden's a nice guy and he'll take care of him. What a desperate act to have to take. The circumstances must be horrible. So we can do something about that. That's what the vice president's going to be doing, what I did. 
when President Obama asked me to come and deal. I was in, I was in uh, Turkey at the time. He said, you got to come home and take care of this. So we put together a plan, and it had an impact. And so the question here is whether how we go ahead and do this, what we do. There's no easy answer. Quick follow, if I may. Do you want to see these unaccompanied minors staying in this, ch this country, or should they be deported eventually? Well, the judgment has to be made whether or not, in, th in this young man's case, he has a mom at home. There's an overwhelming reason why he'd be put in a plane and flown back to his mom. Follow, sir. You mentioned uh, circumstances that must be horrific. The Customs and Border Protection Facility in Donna, Texas, I was there, is at 1,556% capacity yep. right now with mostly unaccompanied minors. There are kids that are sleeping on floors. They are packed into these pods. I've spoken to lawyers who say that they, some of these children have not seen the sun in days. What's your reaction? What is your reaction to these images that have come out from that particular facility? Is what's happening inside acceptable to you? And when is this going to be fixed? I, I, that's a serious question, right? Is it acceptable to me? Come on. That's why we're going to be moving a thousand of those kids out quickly. That's why I got Fort Bliss opened up. That's why I've been working from the moment this started to happen to try to find additional access for children to be able to safely, not just children, but particularly children, to be able to safely be housed while we follow through on the rest of what's happening. That is totally unacceptable. Mr. President, given the conditions that were just laid out at the migrant facilities at the U.S. border, will you commit to allowing journalists to have access to the facilities that are overcrowded moving forward? I will commit when my plan very shortly is underway to let you have access to not just them, but to other facilities as well. How soon will journalists be able to have access to the facilities? We've obviously been allowed to be inside one, but we haven't seen the facilities in which children are packed together to really give the American people a chance to see that. Will you commit to transparency on this issue? I will commit to transparency. And as soon as I am in a position to be able to implement what we're doing right now, and one of the reasons I haven't gone down, I have all my, my chief folks have gone down, is I don't want to become the issue. I don't want to be, you know, bringing all the Secret Service and everybody with me to get in the way. So this is being set up, and you'll have full access to everything once we get this thing moving. And just to be clear, how soon will that be, Mr. President? I don't know, to be clear. You okay. bear responsibility for everything that's happening at the border now. I hear you talking a lot about the past administration. You decided to roll back some of those policies. Did you move too quickly to, to, roll, to roll back, back what? I'm sorry? Policies. Did you move too quickly to roll back some of the executive orders of your predecessor? First of all, all the policies that are underway were not helping at all did not slow up the amount of immigration and as many people coming. And rolling back the policies of separating children from their, from their mothers, I make no apology for that. Rolling back the policies of uh, remain in Mexico, sitting on the edge of the Rio Grande in a muddy circumstance with not enough to eat, I make no apologies for that. I make no apologies for ending programs that did not exist before Trump became president that have an incredibly negative impact on the law, international law, as well as on human dignity. And so I make no apologies for that. I to ask you about... Okay, hang on a second here. Kristen, uh, Nancy, CBS. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I want to go back to voting rights. And as Yamish mentioned, Republican legislatures across the country are working to pass bills that would restrict voting, particularly Democrats fear impacting minority voters and young voters, the very people who helped to get you elected in November. Are you worried that if you don't manage to pass voting rights legislation, that your party is going to lose seats and possibly lose control of the House and the Senate 
in 2022. What I'm worried about is how un-American this whole initiative is. It's sick. It's sick. Deciding in some states that you cannot bring water to people standing in line waiting to vote. Deciding that you're going to end voting at 5 o'clock when working people are just getting off work. Deciding that there will be no absentee ballots under the most rigid circumstances. It's all designed, and I'm going to spend my time doing three things. One, trying to figure out how to pass the legislation passed by the House, number one. Number two, educating the American public. The Republican voters I know find this despicable. Republican voters. The folks out in the — outside this White House. I'm not talking about the, le the elected officials. I'm talking about voters. Voters. And so I'm convinced that we'll be able to stop this because it is the most pernicious thing. This makes Jim Crow look like Jim Eagle. I mean, this is gigantic, what they're trying to do. And it cannot be sustained. And do everything in my power, along with my friends in the House and the Senate, to keep that from, uh, from becoming the law. Is there anything else you can do about it besides passing legislation? The answer is yes, but I'm not going to lay out a strategy in front of the whole world and you now. Then, on a related note, have you decided whether you are going to run for re-election in 2024? You haven't set up a re-election campaign yet, as your predecessor had by this time. <laughs> My predecessor need to, needed to. <laughs> My predecessor. Oh, God, I miss him. Um, no, an answer is yes. My plan is to run for re-election. That's my expectation. And then on, on, on one other note, on bipartisanship, your old friend, Mitch McConnell, says you have only spoken to each other once. Since At you John Lewis's funeral, President Barack Obama said he believed the filibuster was a relic of the Jim Crow era. Do you agree? Yes. If not, why not abolish it if it's a relic of the Jim Crow era? Successful electoral politics is the art of the possible. Let's figure out how we can get this done and move in the direction of significantly changing the abuse of even the filibuster rule first. It's been abused from the time it came into being by an extreme way in the last 20 years. Let's deal with the abuse first. You're moving closer to eliminating the filibuster. Is that correct? I answered your question. You also just made some news by saying that you are going to run for re-election. I said that is my expectation. So is that a yes, that you are running for re-election? Look, I'm, I, I don't know where you guys come from, man. I've never been able to travel. I'm a great respecter of fate. I've never been able to plan four and a half, three and a half years ahead for certain. And if you, it, do, if you do run, will Vice President Harris be on your ticket? I would fully expect that to be the case. She's doing a great job. She's a great partner. She's a great partner. And do you believe you'll be running against former President Trump? Oh, come on. I don't even think about it. I don't have, I have no idea. I have no idea whether there'll be a Republican Party. Do you? I know you don't have to answer my question, but I mean, you know, do you? I mean, look, this is the way I view things. I become a great respecter of fate in my life. I set a goal of this that's in front of me to get things done for the people I care most about, which are hardworking, decent American people who are getting really having it stuck to them. I want to change the paradigm. I want to change the paradigm. We start to reward work, not just wealth. I want to change the paradigm. If you notice, didn't you find it kind of interesting that my Republican friends were worried about that the cost and the taxes that had to be had, if there is any tax to be had, as they talk about it, in dealing with the, the act that we just passed, which puts money in people's pockets, ordinary people. Do you hear them complain when they passed close to $2 trillion Trump tax cut, 83 percent going to the top 1 percent? Do you hear them talk about that at all? I love the fact that they found this whole idea of concern about the federal budget, it's kind of amazing.
when the federal budget is saving people's lives, they don't think it's such a good idea. When the federal budget is feathering the nest of the wealthiest Americans, 90 of the Fortune 500 companies making billions of dollars, not paying a cent in taxes, reducing taxes to the point that people who are making, you know, if you're a husband and wife, school teacher, and a cop, you're paying at a higher rate than the average person making a billion dollars a year is. Something's wrong. Their newfound concern. I'm concerned. Look, I meant what I said when I ran, and a lot of you still think I'm wrong, and I respect that. So I'm running for three reasons. To restore the soul, dignity, honor, honesty, transparency to the American political system. Two, to rebuild the backbone of this country, the middle class, hardworking people and people struggling to get in the middle class. They built America, and unions built them. The third reason I said I was running was to unite the country. And generically speaking, all of you said, no, you can't do that. Well, I've not been able to unite the Congress, but I've been uniting the country based on the polling data. We have to come together. We have to. So from my perspective, you know, it's uh, to me, it, it's, it's about just, you know, getting out there, putting one foot in front of the other and just trying to make things better for people. Just hard working people. People get up every morning and just want to figure out how to put food on the table for their kids, be able to have a little bit of breathing room, being able to have make sure that they go to bed not staring to the ceiling like my dad did, wondering whether, since he didn't have health insurance, what happens if mom gets sick or he got sick. These are basic things, basic things. And I'm of the view that the vast majority of people, including registered Republicans by and large, share that 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 same that same view that same sense of what is uh, you know what's appropriate. More question here, and uh, Janet uh, from Univision. Thank you, Mr. President. We too have been reporting at the border, and just like Cecilia, we ran into a pair of siblings who came in on Monday, were detained by CBP, had the phone number for their mother who lives in the U.S. We have contacted the mother. That's the only way they know her kids are here because CBP today, Thursday, has not contacted that mother. So when can we expect your promise of things getting better with contacting and expediting? Well, they're already process? getting better, but they're going to get real. They're going to get a whole hell of a lot better real quick or we're going to hear some people leaving. Okay? We can get this done. We're going to get it done. I had a long meeting with the entire team and several cabinet level officers the other night we're going to be moving within the next uh, within the next week over a hundred thousand I mean a, a, a thousand people out of uh, the border patrol into safe secure beds and, and facilities we're going to significantly ramp up we're already out there contacting everyone from getting some of the employees at HHS, there's a lot of them doing other things and move them into making those calls. We're in, the, we're in the process of rearranging and providing for the personnel needed to get that done. But I admire the fact that you were down there, you're making the calls yourself. It's real. The next thing that has to happen, though, as you well know, has to happen. There have to be some certitude that this is the, actually mom, dad, or whomever. And there's ways to do that. There's ways to do that, a little bit like determining whether or not you got the right code for your credit card, uh, you know. What, 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 what was your dog's name kind of thing? I'm being a bit facetious, but not really. And also seeking harder data from DNA to, uh, to birth certificates, which takes longer. So I want to do this as, as quickly as humanly possible and as safely as possible. Well, no, treating the root causes in Latin America doesn't change things overnight. How do you realistically and physically keep these families from coming to the U.S. when things will not get better in their countries right away? Well, I, I, I can't guarantee that. But I know, you know, that old thing, the journey of a thousand miles starts with the first step. You know as well as I do. You cover it. You have serious... It's not like somebody sitting in a 
hand you table in Guatemala, I mean, in, uh, in, in somewhere in Mexico or in, in Guadalupe saying, I got a great idea. Let's sell everything we have. Give it to a coyote. Have them take our kids across the border into a desert where they don't speak the language. Won't that be fun? Let's go. That's not how it happens. People don't want to leave. When my great-grandfather got in a coffin ship in the Irish Sea, expectation was, was he, was he going to live long enough on that ship to get to the United States of America? But they left because of what the Brits had been doing. They were in real, real trouble. They didn't want to leave. But they had no choice. So you got, we can't, I can't guarantee we're going to solve everything. But I can guarantee we can make everything better. We can make it better. We can change the lives of so many people. And the other thing I want to point out to you, and I hope you point out, I realize it's much more heart-wrenching, and it is, to deal with a five- and six- and seven-year-old. But you went down there and you saw the vast majority of these children, 70 percent are 16 years old, 17 years old, and mostly males. Doesn't make it, doesn't make it good, bad, or indifferent, but the idea that we have tens of thousands of kids in these god-awful facilities that are really little babies crying all night. There's some. That's true. That's what we got to act. And yesterday, I asked my team, both the director of the two agencies as well as others, I asked them what would they, in fact, and I asked their opinion because they're the experts, but I said, focus on the most vulnerable immediately. But there's no reason why in the next month, as people cross the border, that phone call can't be made in the first 48 hours and begin. If I may ask one last question, have you had any talks with Senate Republicans who are threatening this administration with not considering the immigration legislation that was passed in the House until the situation at the border has been resolved? No, because I know they have to posture for a while. They sort of got to get out of their system. <laughs> Um, this is a uh, um, – but I, I'm ready to work with any Republican who wants to help solve the problem or make, make the situation better. But, folks, I'm going. Thank you very, very much. I appreciate it. Thank you.